Pastor Greg. All right, so I left the title a little vague. Uh, I think the Holy Spirit kind of did it on purpose. It's kind of to make people think a little bit about like what their water is, what it means to them. And it's kind of a personal thing. We partake of it a lot every day. And I'm going to be going through like what's in your water, especially in Arizona. I'm kind of like focusing on that, Arizona. But also what you can do to clean it, filter it, and some things that you can put in it to optimize it for you. So it's more than just kind of a vague slogan here, but um, healthier ways to prepare it and drink it. So I'm really hoping that this is a blessing for you guys. I want to create more of these series. Um, I think the Lord's kind of put it on my heart to do this, especially bring it to this congregation, but also to the, the body as a whole, because we, we need to optimize our health. We need to get ready for difficult times, but also for, you know, all these new diseases that keep popping up. So we have to, we have to be healthy and uh, we have to help our immune systems out a little bit. All right. So I kind of outlined some of the goals. I've kind of talked to you guys a little bit about this too, but one of the, the things at the bottom, our blood is about 80% water by volume. So if whatever water that you're putting in, you're drinking every day, if it's from the tap, if it's from a well, bottled water comes from a lot of different places. I mean, it makes up your blood. And Leviticus 17.11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So your life and, of course, the blood that's circulating in your body, without that blood, you wouldn't have any life. A lot of water in there. So we need to be careful about the water that we are consuming and what's in it. All right, so here's a little bit about the lo uh, local water quality, kind of focused on desert water. So our water here is going to be hard. It's going to have a lot of sodium and calcium in it. Um, that's not the case everywhere in the United States, but of course, like in the deserts, it kind of picks it up as it goes from the mountains down into the valleys. So we have a lot of minerals in the water. I mean, minerals are good in water. It's just if you have too many of them, it can also cause calcification. So you need the balance between too much and, and too little. If you don't have enough minerals, the water can leach. It can take minerals out of your bones. Um, but if you have too much minerals, it can kind of deposit those minerals in places you don't want them. So you have to be careful about that. Um, cool thing is in Arizona, they do a lot of water processing at plants and there's a lot of recycling. Um, and there's a lot of cool things that they do in the desert to um, kind of clean out our water. So it's, it's decent drinking water quality. Um, I have the 2021 water quality report. It's for the city of Phoenix. Um, if anybody's interested, they can look that up online. It's just like a quick PDF, but it kind of gives you more detailed information about the, the basic water purity standards that are in Arizona, but also kind of in Phoenix, uh, particularly. It's going to tell you about certain chemicals that are in the water. Some of them like chlorine, fluoride, they add the chlorine, um, just like kind of what's in your pool. It can, um, disinfect certain things that you don't want, certain bacteria. Uh, that you don't want uh, in your body, but um, too much of it in the drinking water, there's a little bit of detrimental effects. It can probably affect your microbiome a little bit, so you want to kind of take care of your gut. If you're able to um, uh, flush that out or filter it out, it's probably a good thing in your, in your home water. All right, so in our source water, um, Let's see here, there are certain contaminants in the source, source water, which is essentially like your tap water. So viruses and bacteria, those are gonna get picked up as they go through the system, let's say. Um, and most of the time, the water treatment plants are gonna help to um, clean some of those out. Uh, but you will have some uh, pesticides and herbicides from agricultural runoff um, that's going to find its way into the water. Usually that stuff gets cleaned out by the, the water plants. They have certain standards that they have to meet. And there's going to be lots of testing that's done uh, to make sure that there's the pesticides or besides are not in very high quantities. Our water is still salty, even though it gets, it gets filtered a little bit. There's a certain amount of metals that, like heavy metals, mercury, cadmium, lead, um, probably like nickels in there. But there's certain metals where... It, 
the amounts of those heavy metals because there's like no healthy standard for mercury, let's say, in your body, those are going to be monitored really well in the water treatment plants. There's also other things in our water like synthetic and volatile organic chemicals. So these would be things from like petroleum production, gas stations, runoff, maybe some sometimes if we were to have um, like rain runoff, it goes on the street, there's oil spills on the street, it kind of goes into the system and it makes our way into the water, but that stuff has to get cleaned out definitely before it gets to um, our, our taps. Maybe even some radioactive contaminants. I don't know how. Oh, well, we do have some mining activities in Arizona. So, I mean, maybe the places like Surprise, Globe, those places where they have the mines, they may have to worry about that a little bit more than we do in the valley. But um, that is something to consider if you live by an active mine. All right, so this one, this is about lead and copper levels. So in old homes, there is... Um, you could have lead pipes in some of the, the older homes around town. I'm thinking maybe the older parts of Phoenix, maybe like Arcadia, some of those old houses, the, uh, the single story ranches, like closer to downtown Phoenix, where those homes are close to a hundred years old, 1920s, thirties, forties. They may have some of those issues. Um, but even maybe homes that are a little bit newer than that are going to have lead pipes. So it's probably a good thing to get your water tested at home, or if you're not able to test it at home, see what you can filter out. So you may, you may just have to, you know, kind of suck it up and say, okay, I'm just going to have to filter out some of these heavy metals because I'm not going to tear up my kitchen or my bathroom and kind of clean out and put new like PVC pipes in. So those are things to just consider that could be in your home if, if you do have an older home. Uh, the copper levels, you're going to get copper because there's lots of copper piping in the house. So most houses are, have copper piping for certain things. Uh, copper in certain levels is going to be healthy. It's actually very antimicrobial. They use copper in the hospital setting for certain uh, surfaces. But uh, too much copper um, is just going to, uh, it's not necessarily too good for your health. All right, so the maximum containment level allowed in your drinking water. So for federal and state. So I'm not going to go totally in depth on this, but it's just interesting to think that there is a certain level of contaminants that is allowed in your drinking water. So you just have to think of it like that. Like there are certain heavy metals in here that are allowed. Um, it might be a very small level. You know, they, they probably do studies that say, oh, well, if it's under this amount, there's we haven't seen any effects on your system, but what I want to present to you guys today is just because it's a minimum level allowed, is it really something that you want in your even if it's a minimum amount? So something to consider when uh, you turn on the tap, think of these things could be in your water now and they're allowed to be in there because they're under a certain range where they think it's not going to be harmful to your health. All right, this was a test that the city of Phoenix did, the uh, crypto and giardia. So these are bacteria that can produce uh, diarrhea. So if you were to ever drink from like a stream or uh, a source of water that may be still, uh, you always, if you were in that case, you'd always wanna drink water from like a, a, a running source. It's because uh, water that moves or is running typically doesn't give bacteria as much of a chance to reproduce. But a lot of times, like if you were to ever get like diarrhea as a hiker and you were drinking from the water in the, in the woods, it could be due to giardia or some of these bacteria that are just naturally growing uh, in the stream. So in Phoenix, they tested our water and they didn't find um, like allowable levels of these bacteria. But just know that these, some of these bacteria could be getting into the water and it's, you don't just have to worry about the heavy metals. You'd also have to consider living organisms that could be in there as well. Ooh, this, is a, this is an interesting one. They've made, they've, they've done tests in our water. So medications. So there's been some controversy about this. Um, a lot of scientists are trying to figure out why 
globally, testosterone levels in men are on the decline. And it's been that way for a couple decades. Now, there's no definitive proof that it's due to medications, and I don't want to make that connection, but there are medications in our water that don't necessarily get filtered out at the treatment plant level. So you have to understand that a lot of uh, medications, and when they did tests on the medications, a lot of times it was things from very common medications that people have in their homes, like acetaminophen, Tylenol. So a lot of painkillers in the water, people are just gonna urinate those out and they don't necessarily get filtered out in the water treatment plants. So you have to think that there's some medications that are going to be in your tap water. So you wanna be aware of that. There also can be hormones in your tap water. So I might get that on the next slide, but things like caffeine, oxybenzone is actually a constituent in a lot of uh, suntan lotions. It's actually a hormone blocker. Um, <laughs> a side note, if you were to, if, if you want to have a natural uh, sunscreen, I recommend uh, just like the zinc sunscreens that you can spray on. Oxybenzone, there's other uh, chemicals that they put in conventional sunscreens, you probably want to stay away from those because your skin absorbs pretty much everything that comes on it, especially if it's fat soluble um, compounds like oxybenzone because so, your skin absorbs fat soluble components. So you want to be really careful what you put on your skin, plus it's in your water. So I don't want to scare you guys, but I want you to be aware of things that are in the water. Some other things that could be circulating that don't necessarily get filtered, BPA. So I'm sure most of you have probably heard of BPA. They put it, they line the cans with it. It's, it's a way that manufacturers can uh, kind of insulate cans or uh, plastic bottles, uh, make them a little bit more flexible for storage and for transport. BPA is a hormone disrupting chemical, it actually mimics estrogen uh, in the body. So BPA, um, you might think, well, you know, I'm a lady, it might not hurt me as much, but uh, if you were to have high levels of this, it doesn't matter, uh, man or female, it's going to either cause maybe an estrogen excess in females if, if you have high quantities, or in men it's gonna, it may have a more detrimental effect on your body composition. So you want to be aware of that. That's in a lot of plastics. A lot of companies are trying to take BPA out of the plastics, which is good. That's a good step in the right direction. But there's one called like BPS. So they're coming up with different ways to get around the wording uh, just so that they can kind of have their goal of uh, like flexible plastic. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. Um, some other ones on there, methotrexate, is an immune suppressant, antibiotics. Uh, I had mentioned the caffeine and acetaminophen. It's really just common medications that people are just urinating and they're just not uh, getting filtered kind of at the city level or state level. So I'm imploring you guys to filter them at the home level in your kitchen, bathroom, wherever, or home water system. If the city's not gonna do it, I want you guys to do it uh, for your own health. I am going to give you guys some tips and tricks to do. Uh, that's the powerful part of this lesson. I don't want to just kind of show you what to avoid. I want to also equip you for what to do about it. So, and there was, there are, there were some studies, I think it was like 2011, there was a study that said, um, I think he was talking about uh, the, the BPA or the, um, the birth control. So here it is. So, um, there is birth control that they have found in drinking water. So just like the BPA, it can get in the drinking water and birth hormone is composed of typically either estrogen or progesterone or it's one or the other. Um, but because it's so common for especially young girls to take it, they can take it for acne or other purposes. Um, it's gonna be in the water because it's commonly used and it's just not filtered out like some of those other components that I talked to you about. A lot of people will uh, pick out the, the birth control and they say, well, you know, this could be contributing to why it, there's changes in animals. And I think there was a study um, on frogs or on other animals or on fish. 
I don't know if I included it in here, but there was a study on tadpoles, and it, and it showed that tadpoles that were in water that had been contaminated with some of these hormones, it did disrupt their uh, their development into male tadpoles. So I think there does need to be a little bit more research into this. Um, and it's not something I want you guys to be scared about, but just know that because so many people are actually consuming these hormones, they are going to end up in the water. Even in small quantities that might not affect you, they're still going to be there, most likely. And then it talks a little bit about, this was a little bit about the male fish. Um, one of the studies showed that male fish had been found with ovaries and female biomarkers. The long-term exposure um, can produce fish that are less fertile across generations. So this is where people thought that maybe the, the decrease in global levels of testosterone in men could be linked to these hormones. Maybe, maybe not. But it's, it's a theory. It's a hypothesis. Um, definitely needs to be more research done into it over time, long-term studies, to see the effects on humans. Of course, this is just on fish right here. But um, a lot of these things can get into our lakes and rivers, uh, water runoff from streets, and um, you know monsoon storms that might cause water damage. That could end up getting into washes and streams, and then it kind of gets into the, the ecosystem that way. And again, I don't want to scare you guys. I just want you to make informed decisions based on this information. All right, here's the powerful stuff. How can we change our water? So filtration is a great way to produce a change in the water. You can do it at the home level. You don't have to rely on somebody else to do this. The three ways that I've highlighted here are probably the most common ways that you guys are going to be able to do this in the home, the most practical ways. The first one, reverse osmosis. I like reverse osmosis. I have one in my home. I really recommend that one, but there are some things I'm going to explain to you about. If you're going to have reverse osmosis in the home, you also need to do some other things to, um, to help yourself that way. Activated charcoal. It's been around for a long time. The charcoal filters where water uh, goes through the, the black little pe pellets and pebbles that you might have in, in a little pitcher of water. Those are pretty common. Those have been around for a long time. There's, there's different filtration systems when it comes to charcoal filters. There's block or granulated. I'll kind of go over that a little bit more. It's not really that complicated. It's just um, different ways that, they, uh, that you can use the filters. And then there's water softeners, which I'm sure most of us here in Arizona are kind of aware of. It's called deionization because the water softeners, pretty much what they do is they swap minerals, but I'll kind of go over that in a little bit. There's other ways to filter or clean water that I'm going to mention here, but not really go into too much more detail. Ozone sterilization. So ozone is O3. It's three oxygen molecules. molecules. Ozone is actually, it can be used in uh, medical practice uh, purposes uh, as a disinfectant, but it can also be used to disinfect and sterilize uh, water. It's kind of a cool thing that they can do, pretty cost effective. But at home, ozone sterilization, probably not something you're going to run into or, or think about too much. Uh, distillation, it's been around for a long time. I don't really think there's great distillation apparatuses that you guys can like go and buy. So I, I don't really want to go into that too much, but that's just heating up the water to kind of uh, kill off any bacteria. And then there's just mechanical filters that can kind of filter out, filter out the water. So I want to focus on the couple of things that you can actually do and take home with you. So we'll talk about the charcoal home filters. So charcoal can reduce kind of like the nasty taste that you might get. Phoenix d definitely has nasty tasting water. I'm from the Great Lakes region and our water f out of the tap tastes better. <laughs> it tastes kind of like it's filtered. So I'm a little biased there, but uh, I'm just happy to have uh, safe drinking water here in the desert. It's kind of nice. But what charcoal filters can do is they can kind of minimize that taste a little bit. They can reduce the odor a little bit and they can reduce some of the chlorine that gets put into the water during the disinfection uh, process at the city level. 
They're going to put chlorine in there to kill bacteria. It does a great job at reducing bacteria. But again, if it's going to kill bacteria, it's also going to potentially, in high enough levels, reduce bacteria in your gut throughout your small intestine, your colon. You want to keep those good bacteria in there. You don't necessarily want to get rid of those for your gut health. So uh, just be aware of that. There's some other things that uh, the charcoal filters can help with. Chlorine and chloramines. Uh, are they added during the treatment process? The chloramines, I believe, can be released when you're taking a shower in hot water. It's kind of weird, but when you're taking a hot shower in, you know, of course, like tap water or shower water, there's certain, the chlorine can actually um, get into the air and you can breathe it in and it still has kind of like antibacterial effects even when you breathe it in. Um, a way to actually combat that that I didn't put in these slides is actually with a vitamin C filter on your showers. I didn't talk about that too much in here, but that's something interesting that you guys can look into if you want to shower with chlorine-free water. It's kind of a cool thing. I've, I've put one on my showers before. You have to keep uh, replacing the filters because the, the vitamin C kind of gets bound after a while. But vitamin C to reduce chlorine and some of the hardness in water, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, there's some other uh, kind of filter mediums that are kind of like charcoal, uh, coconut shell, and there's some wood-based ones that can also f help to filter the water that they might use in a charcoal filter. So you have charcoal filters, but you also have what's called activated carbon filters or activated charcoal filters. The activation process is with uh, heat or steam and what it does is it increases the surface area of the charcoal. So charcoal works by, the, the way that it works is because it has a lot of surface area. If you were to look at it under a microscope, it'd be very jagged. So as the water passes through the charcoal, the minerals, contaminants, uh, the chlorine, it's going to actually get trapped in the crevices of the charcoal. Activated charcoal just really increases the surface area of the charcoal. Bottom line, it just helps, it filters more, but it's gonna filter more slowly. So if you're, if you're gonna have a greater filtering, uh, filtering capacity, um, it's gonna filter slower because there's a lot more surface area that water has to run over. Um, you, don't, you guys don't necessarily have to know that. I'd say activated charcoal filters are probably the way to go if you're gonna do a, a charcoal filter. Um, I believe they have charcoal filters for home use. I think I have a picture uh, further on in the slides, but that's something you guys can consider. So activated carbon filters or charcoal filters, they can actually remove more things than just regular carbon filters can. So they can actually remove heavy metals like mercury, uh, some of the pesticides and herbicides, iron, lead, bacteria, and the trihalomethane methanes. But one thing that carbon filters don't do is they don't soften the water. So they don't necessarily swap out uh, the minerals like calcium and, and sodium. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the uh, water softening a little bit later, but they don't soften the water. So you're still gonna have hard water, which uh, carbon filters. All right, here's some, here are some examples. So. Um, this would be an example of a home filter on the far right, and they actually have it outside. It's kind of crazy, but here are some filters that you might find for uh, maybe under the sink. Um, I think those are uh, activated carbon filters, and then on the far left side of the PowerPoint, that's a. This is actually a Berkey filter, so you don't necessarily have to find a filter underneath the sink, you can actually find them uh, a portable that you can actually take with you. You can put it on top of the, your countertop in your sink or you can take it with you. Um, that one's called a Berkey filter. I'm not associated with them. I'm just saying that they're, they're a name that I know of back when I was going to uh, medical school. Some people actually had them and they actually liked it. They thought it was a quick and easy way that they could kind of filter their water. So you don't necessarily have to have something that you put underneath your sink uh, it can be more simple than that. All right, reverse osmosis. So 
reverse osmosis is a way to filter like 90 plus percent of everything that's in the water. So it's really going to take almost everything out of the water and it's going to do that by pushing the water through a semi-permeable membrane. It's actually a similar way that they um, that they filter seawater for desalination. A lot of times they'll use reverse osmosis as a means to do that. So reverse osmosis is going to filter water. It's a water intensive process so there's the water that comes into your sink you're going to get a small amount of filtered water. There's actually a larger amount of water that is briny, so it's a lot of salt in it, and that just goes down the sink. So you don't, you really don't see that. But it's an energy-intensive process um, with desalination. But in the home, it's just, it's just going to produce some, some nice water. So you don't really have to worry about that other stuff. It's going to remove, like I said, it's going to remove kind of like everything. So. It's going to remove fluoride. It's going to remove the salts, the minerals like the calcium and the sodium. It's going to remove any sediment. Maybe some sand gets in there. Um, it's going to remove volatile organic compounds. It's going to remove the pesticides, herbicides, um, and even other dissolved solids. So it, it's really going to remove almost everything. So at the end of all that removing of water, when water loses minerals, it actually becomes a little bit acidic. So it's no longer... Uh, neutral or basic, it actually becomes acidic. And when you drink acidic water, it can actually leach or take minerals from areas of your body. So it may take minerals from uh, food that you've recently eaten. It could take minerals from bone, teeth. So it's not going to, you know, rot away your bones or your teeth. You know, it's not going to take that many minerals away, but Water, it, it wants to come back to equilibrium. It wants to come back to a, a place where it's in a neutral pH around 7. So um, it's just going to be attractive to minerals. So one thing that I'm going to talk to you about later in these slides is how you can remineralize this water, which I think is really valuable. And when you do get reverse osmosis systems, they typically come with a pre and post filter. So when they come in your house, typically... Uh, a system that you have underneath the sink. I have one at my house. The water is going to go through the pre-filter, which is going to typically contains charcoal in it. It's going to get filtered. It goes through the reverse osmosis membrane, and then it goes through a post-filter just to make sure that everything gets filtered out. And then it comes into typically a holding tank, and from that holding tank, it'll come up through a spout, and you can drink it that way. So it, it takes some time to kind of fill up that tank just because of it's going, the water has to go through, you know, three filters every time it enters your home. So it's, it's worth it, in my opinion, but um, it's just a, it's an intensive process to clean the water. Typically reverse osmosis systems, they're used under the sink. You, you don't find too many whole home filtration systems, although I think you can find them. Uh, whole, like at home uh, systems that kind of clean water that enters your house. That's typically water softeners. You might be able to find charcoal filters that do that, but it's typically water softeners for whole house systems, which it's probably going to be good for your appliances, your showers and stuff like that. But to find a reverse osmosis system for the whole house, they're going to be expensive. It's, it's not that practical. I wouldn't recommend it unless like you're really gung ho about it. But I would say if you're going to do an RO system, you probably want to install it under the sink. That's probably the, the easiest way that you're going to find it uh, to do it at home. Some reverse osmosis systems actually do come with an extra filter. So it would probably be like a fourth filter, and it actually puts some of the minerals back in. So you can either buy a filter that does that, that maybe puts some of the calcium and magnesium back into the water, or you can do that yourself. So I will explain ways that you can do it yourself that are kind of, that are pretty easy and self-explanatory. But you definitely want to put minerals back in. So the under the water, or the under the sink um, installation is typically the one that you see on the left with the tank and the three filters. And the one on the right, I believe is like a, it, it's, it's like an industrial RO system. It, I don't know if it's used at home, but they're really not common.
to use as like a whole house system. So you're, you're probably your best bet's going to be the under the, the sink. And then when it comes to water softeners, um, they use what's called ion exchange. So it's going to capture calcium and magnesium, which is very common in our waters in, in Arizona. We have a lot of calcium, magnesium, and sodium. And it's going to uh, release sodium and potassium back into the water. So sodium and potassium have a uh, like a couple relationship there. I don't know how to, the best way to describe it. The same with calcium and magnesium. They they work hand in hand. So a lot of times in the body, calcium and magnesium can kind of work hand in hand. If you take calcium, you also want to take magnesium. Um, they're both good for the heart, but uh, you want to take them in the right quantities, the right way. Sodium and potassium kind of act that same way, but um, I like that it puts potassium back into the water because with a lot of people, uh, potassium is a much needed electrolyte in our water and it can, it can be useful, especially the heart needs uh, adequate levels of potassium to function as well. But too much isn't good, so you have to be careful there. Some symptoms of hard water that I'm sure most of us are kind of aware of, scratchy, kind of rough clothing, spots on dishes, you're gonna get the film on the shower. Uh, I'm sure most of us kind of understand this already, but maybe people online that are watching from other areas of the United States might not get this, but um, you're gonna get the buildup. I know I get buildup on my water hose outside. It just builds up with calcium easily. I don't even have to touch it, it just builds up. So um, that's how you know that the water is very hard. It has a lot of calcium, magnesium, sodium in it. And the, the softening of the water, some cool stats that I actually found about water softeners, is it can actually be economical and financially a good thing to have in the house. There was one study that actually took into account that uh, softened water actually reduces the amount of soap that you need. Um, I believe this is more than just like hand soap. It could also be soap um, like in the shower, but it, it really depends. Um, I think it has to do with um, the amount of soap that you actually apply on your body. Uh, hard water can actually kind of leave, you can kind of feel like a filmy sensation on your skin I don't know if anybody's kind of felt that. I've definitely felt that sometimes. But when you re or demineralize that water or use the ion exchange, it can actually reduce the amount of soap that you end up using uh, personally. But it can also increase the life of clothing by 33%. And what I thought was very economical, it can actually prevent a 24% loss in efficacy of your water heaters and other appliances because that water buildup can reduce the efficacy of some of those appliances. So something to consider. Um, probably if you want to um, have the efficacy or the, the, the better performance in water heaters, appliances, that would probably be something that you'd want a whole, whole home filtration system uh, with a water softener to do that. And some of the water softening systems, they have what's called a mineral tank and they have a brine tank. So the water comes in through that mineral tank, you have the ion exchange, it takes the calcium and magnesium, it puts out the sodium and potassium. And then some of that briny water goes into the brine, the brine tank on the side. So that's what they're gonna look like in the house. Um, kind of a cool system there. And I think they're pretty easy to get. You can go to Home Depot's Lowe's, kind of those kind of places, and you're going to find them there. All right. I think this is going to be the most interesting part of this whole discussion because I don't know too many people who talk about this. Certainly doctors or healthcare practitioners that are actually recommending people to optimize your water at home. I have certainly never been told this by a physician but I want to present this information to you guys to optimize your water and to make your water work for you and not against you. So when you add the minerals back in, let's say trace minerals, let's say you're adding uh, sodium back into the water once it's been filtered through an RO system, you're going to, you're adding electrical charge back to that water. Water should have a, a charge and a, and a, 
an electrical affinity. It should have um, a, a, an energetic component to it. Dead water would be water that doesn't have any minerals at all. So it's, it has no electrical or energetic component to it. You don't want to be drinking dead water. I want you guys to be drinking water that has minerals and, and life to it, life in it. So some things that you can do to add back into the water would be um, one of them that even that I use is electrolyte powders. So you can find powders that um, have maybe like a lemon or lime kind of flavor, peach flavor. They don't have much sugar in them, but they give you just a little bit of flavor. You could add it into a pitcher of water. You can mix it in there and it can add flavor into the water. It can also help what I found it to be helpful with. It can also help with you to drink more water. So if your water actually tastes better, you'll probably drink more of it. Um, if it tastes gross, you're probably going to avoid it. And uh, especially in the summertime, I don't want people to avoid drinking the adequate amount of water because most of us are going to be sweating more water out in the summertime than we really understand. We sweat, the dryness really takes that water right off your skin and you don't even realize how much water you've actually expended to cool off your body. So anything that's going to increase the taste of, of your water, make it healthy for you um, without maybe sugar is probably a good way to go. Oh, hold on. I'll go through it. I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, some other things that you can add into your water, salt. So you can actually add salt back into the water. I would recommend this, of course, for an RO system uh, because the reverse osmosis system is going to take most of those minerals out. So if you add maybe a little bit of Himalayan pink salt, you could add Celtic sea salt. You could add volcanic salt. I'm pretty sure there's salts out there that are like black. So there's, there's different uh, mineral compositions in some of these salts that you can find throughout the world. If you add those back into your water, of course, you don't want to add too much back into it, then it would kind of taste gross. But you want to add just a little bit in there, maybe a pinch or so. It remineralizes the water, and it's going to make the water healthy for you. And um, it's going to return that water back to the neutral pH, and it's going to make it healthier for you. I think rock salt can sometimes come as the, that black salt. All right, so what I'd suggest is if you were to get a picture of water, a pitcher of water, so get a large quantity, like I have a little pitcher at home, it's about like two liters, it's like a little terracotta pouring picture. What you can do is you can get your reverse osmosis water, put it in the picture, in the pitcher, and you can add, let's say, a quarter, of tables, a quarter of a teaspoon of, let's say, Himalayan pink salt per gallon or so. Um, of course, you don't want to add too much, but you put a little bit back in. You could also add potentially, you could do the salt. You could add an electrolyte uh, packet to it. So there's a couple things that you can add back in, stir it up, and it's actually going to taste a lot better than what you think it might taste. And it's easy. It's something that you can do at home, and it can, of course, optimize your health, not just, not just keep you at status quo. There's also some vegetable powders out there, fruit powders that you could add to water. A lot of the vegetable powders are going to be like greens powders, like chlorella, uh, let's say like a grass kind of powder. You could add those into your water. I wouldn't want it to be too chalky. I guess you're going to have to kind of experiment with that. But some of those vegetable powders or fruit powders, um, you'd want to look for one that's low in sugar because I, I don't want you guys to put it in your water and, and it comes with a lot of sugar in it and then you're just you know spiking your, your glucose there. So I want you guys to find something that has the minerals, has some antioxidants, but no sugar. So it kind of keeps it, it's still kind of basic water, but um, without, the, without the sugar. And they make fruit powders too. They make like uh, pomegranate powders and stuff like that that you can add. They ha it has antioxidants in it. It may have some trace minerals in it. It could have some some herbal stuff in there too. So something to consider and look for. I have some pictures on the next slide that I'll show you guys. There's also some water pitchers that you can use. They're kind of, they're pretty common. Uh, a lot of the water pitchers have charcoal filters in them, but as long as, 
as you're even doing basic filtration, I think it's, it's, a, good, it's a good start. And if you want to go further from there, you can definitely do that. A cool one down here, I could probably do a full lecture on fulvic acid. So a few years ago, I didn't even know what fulvic acid was. So fulvic acid, it's actually a plant and animal material that is ancient in origin, probably was deposited there by Noah's flood. You know, a scientist isn't going to tell you that, but uh, the way that they describe it um, in the Himalayan mountains is actually where this fulvic acid is usually taken from, same place that they get the Himalayan pink salt when they mine it. It's actually a, break, a breakdown of plant and animal material that's ancient, thousands of years old. And in the fulvic acid, they've found a lot of minerals, a lot of nutrients in there, um, and it's pretty much taken from ancient soil. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, it's not like you're going to be like tasting dirt. You know, you can find fulvic acid. It, it has a little bit of a mineral taste, but it actually doesn't taste that bad. Um, I think I have a slide on here on fulvic acid. So there was a study that they did. And this was in 2019. They found that the concentration of total polyphenols, so polyphenols are antioxidants, or total flavonoids, also antioxidants, in fulvic acid concentrates and certain values that they used to measure them were much higher than reported for certain other beverages like wine, fruit juices, antioxidant uh, enriched juices and iced teas. So essentially what they're saying is the fulvic acid had more antioxidants than some of the red wines that they tested. It had more uh, polyphenols and flavonoids than certain fruit juices and even some iced teas. So I think fulvic acid is actually a really potent, um, very nutrient dense, mineral dense substance. It's, it comes in a liquid typically, or you can find it in a powder, but that would be something really interesting that you could add to your pitcher of water to return some of those minerals back in there and actually have your water work for you and, and help you in, in optimizing your health. Uh, one of the same research showed that it actually contained high amounts of iron, magnesium, and manganese, uh, as well as a high antioxidant activity. So there's probably some of us in here who, at one point in time in their, in their health, had low iron levels, and they've been told to take iron. Um, this could be a way that you could get maybe not a full amount of iron that you would need, but it would be a way to actually get iron in your system um, that's different than actually getting maybe an IV of iron or um, taking a, a supplement that might give you some constipation. So this is something to consider. All right, so here are some examples. I know uh, Pastor Anita had asked kind of what are some of these examples going to look like. So this is just basic stuff that I found online. So the fulvic acid, a lot of times it comes in a, a liquid kind of you can, you can buy it in like a tub kind of um, something that you can put in your fridge. Um, another thing that you can do is trace mineral drops. There's certain companies that will make trace mineral drops where you don't have to add the salt and add the other stuff together. If you wanted a simple way to put minerals back in, you can actually buy the drops and you can just sprinkle some of the drops in the water and you, you should be good to go. When it comes to electrolyte powders, there's probably a lot out there. I don't know if there's a good Gatorade powder. I think Gatorade and some of the other uh, like sports drinks are going to have glucose in them. They're going to have sugar. That might be helpful for an athlete that is currently exercising or in a hypoglycemic state. But if you're just drinking water around the house, I'd rather uh, the water not have sugar in it. We get sugar in most things that we eat nowadays with high carbs. I'd rather that not be in our electrolyte powder, but you guys can ultimately make that decision. They make little, um, if you don't want like a jug of the powder that you kind of scoop out, they make packets. Uh, that's just one brand. There's other brands that don't have much uh, sugar in them. They actually taste pretty good. And then an example of the fruit or uh, like plant green powders, uh, the Garden of Life makes one. There's other ones out there. But as long as you can... Uh, you know, stomach the taste of maybe a greens powder that doesn't taste that great. It's going to be helping you. It's going to put the minerals back in the water and you're actually going to be optimizing your health. You're going to be helping yourselves uh, just by drinking 
you know, the one or two liters of water that you drink on a daily basis. You were going to drink that water anyways. You might as well um, make it the best water possible for you. All right, here are some references. So if anybody wants these references, I can definitely provide them to you guys. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to put this PowerPoint on the Arrowhead website, but I can always email these to people if they wanted them. Um, these are just basic websites that I got some of this information from. If you want to look further, there's lots of information out there. But um, I always encourage people to think for themselves and to do your research if you're really interested in something. It's, it's never going to hurt you if, you if you go and do research, especially for your health. Um, you're going to learn some things along the way. All right, and that concludes everything that I was going to show you guys. Um, I will be able to answer some questions after everything's over if you guys have some simple questions for me. Um, that should be doable. So one thing that I can do while I'm still up here is we can kind of pray about this and uh, ask the Lord to kind of put it on our hearts to make our health a priority, um, especially for the body of Christ. I want us to be the healthiest people on this earth and to also show our family what we can do to optimize our health um, especially even if they're unbelievers, they'll definitely take notice if we have vibrant health and they don't, and they're, they're wondering, hey, what makes you different than us? Well, our Lord provides us this information, and the information and knowledge is powerful. So thank you again. Um, let's pray real quick uh, before I finish everything off. So dear Lord, I just want to come before you and thank you that I have the opportunity to present this information especially for this congregation that I really care about and everyone in here. I just want everyone in here to take this information to heart, consider it, ponder it, meditate on it, and to consider what is, what is in what they drink, Lord, in such a basic thing that we probably take for granted each and every day. What is, what is in our water? How can, how can you make this, Lord, that it, it is a net positive for us and not a detriment to us. And Lord, I just ask that you bless everyone in here with this information and that our health and uh, can be a wealth for us, Lord Jesus. It can be a blessing and that we can teach our families how to live a better way with abundant, more abundant health, exactly what Jesus promised us when he said, I want to give you more abundant health. So that's certainly what I want to bring here today. And Lord, I just, I thank you that I get to, I get to speak here and certainly more to come. There will be more of these kind of presentations. And I know the Lord's going to, going to give us um, more information and he'll be able to speak through the, the leaders in this congregation on and what information to give to this congregation specifically and everyone who is uh, tuning in on the live stream so that we can personally um, help everyone in here. So thank you very much and amen.